promoting dialogue between followers of different faiths. But is religion a source of unity or division? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to this edition of Inside Story. I'm Mike Hanna. It's blamed for wars and discrimination, yet embraced as a means of resolution and integration. Religion is also the source of many arguments, while some studies suggest it's on the decline. A conference here in Doha is promoting a message of interfaith dialogue, of religion as a means of global coexistence, raising the question, can different faiths work together for a common good? Bernard Smith helps to get this discussion going. Under one roof, representatives of the world's major faiths came together to explore common ground and to work to try to highlight what they see as the positive role of religion in a world where religion often gets blamed for creating conflict and intolerance. This is very helpful in terms of breaking the misconceptions. Um, you know, with all the challenges we challenges that we have in the peace building process, you know, the barriers to achieving peace. It is very important that we search for a common ground and this is one of the, uh, the common grounds that we have where we, we just get to talk, we, we, it's, a, it's, a, it's a dialogue between uh, you know, people from different faiths, from, from different cultures, uh, discussing about um, what we can do to, in order to build a peaceful society. So definitely we need to multiply more of these programs in different countries. If we go closer to the roots of religion, if we take Christianity for instance, if we, take, if we go to the roots of Christianity, this is a religion about love. But if we go to the roots of Islam, it's a religion of tolerance. But both Christians and Muslims have somehow forgotten and ignored our origins. And if we bring love and tolerance together, we are going to have a fairer society, fairer world, where we can live peacefully. And I don't think there is any other alternative to that. The point of interfaith is to try to, uh, let's get beyond the stereotypes, let's understand people's multiple parts of their identity. Yes, I'm Jewish, I'm also Iraqi Jewish, Canadian, living in London. Uh, there's many parts of me that won't come across and I think that that's for us as educators to to be able to uh, transmit and only in places like this can really thinkers who think around these issues really uh, take advantage of a collective wisdom. Of course the challenge for the delegates here is getting their reasoned voices heard in a world where they're often drowned out by the louder angrier voices. Bernard Smith, Inside Story, Doha. Well, it's often said that religion is the number one cause of war, but the three-volume Encyclopedia of Wars, which chronicles almost 1,800 conflicts waged over the course of human history, categorizes just 123 as being religious. It's an easy generalization to make. Fighting in Central African Republic is regarded as being between Muslims and Christians. Buddhists and Rohingya Muslims are at the heart of violence in Myanmar. And conflict in Northern Ireland had its roots in religion. The Palestinian-Israeli conflict is also seen as having a religious dimension. But in all these examples, there may be more fundamental driving forces, be it land, power or nationalism. Well, let's bring in our guests, and for the purpose of this discussion, we have invited representatives from the three monotheistic religions, those that believe in one God. With me here is a Professor Ibrahim Saleh Al Naimi, a chairman of Doha International Center for Interfaith Dialogue, and Archbishop Makarios Mavro Janakis, um, who is head of the Greek Orthodox Church in Doha. And joining us from Jerusalem is Rabbi David Rosen, International Director of Interreligious Affairs for the Global Jewish Adv Advocacy. Welcome to you all. You. Let's begin with Archbishop Makarios. Um, there is a belief that in the past religion has been more of a source of conflict than a solution. What's your view? 
My view, it is that is not the source, the religion, but it is the religion abused uh, from many other powers because in uh, all of the religions, in the holy books and uh, in the teaching of the religion, the peace, it is one of the big uh, values that it is respecting and is, uh, and is in the uh, teaching of, uh, of the religion. Well, let's go to Rabbi David Rosen on that particular point. Uh, your view, do you also think that religion is sometimes a scapegoat in a conflict? Uh, in, I certainly do think that uh, the Archbishop, Archbishop is making an important point. I think we need to appreciate that conflicts uh, relate to identities. Uh, as was said in the introduction, these identities might clash over land, over national interests, but where people have identities, and these are rooted within culture and therefore within religious attachments, and these inevitably are exploited in the context of the conflict, each one for self-justification or for denigration of the other. All uh, human conditions can be used in a destructive or a constructive way, but I certainly agree that the essence of all our religions is to seek the welfare of humanity, the goodness of society, to emphasize the dignity of the human person, the divine presence is to be found amongst us all, and if we are really true to those noble truths, then we will not behave in a violent way to each other. Well, Professor Ibrahim, your, your, your view on this, do you see religion as being used as an excuse uh, in causes of conflict? Well, I think the, the peace itself is one of the names of uh, the God, Allah, as salam. So um, all those uh, uh, believers and uh, religious people, if they believe in that word, I think they will ne never really uh, uh, wage a war because of, uh, under that name. The, just the opposite. I think it's as I agree with uh, Father Makarius that the religion has been used, the, uh, the name has been used throughout the ages to, to, to rage wars and to take land to, and to, uh, you know, to, to, to do whatever uh, horrible things that happen, that's happening. And I think again, what the, you showed a film that uh, whatever it ha is happening in, 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 the, in, in, in Myanmar or in, uh, in Central Africa, it's not a religious war. In fact, it's, uh, it's been, uh, definitely it's been used by, by, by some of these gangs and gangsters to, to, you know, to, 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 to put the people, to give them the feeling that they really, we are defending you, are defending your, your, your beliefs, and we, we, you know, so you, they can believe in this war. But I don't think, none of, none of us, I think, agrees with, with that. Well, well, Rabbi David Rosen, um, in, in one of your lectures, you said that if religion is not going to be a problem, then it has to be a solution. Well, absolutely. I think that um, there is a tendency very often on the part of secular politicians and diplomats to avoid the religious dimension of conflicts. It's not that religion isn't, uh, I, I reaffirm that religion is not at the source of these conflicts, whether it be in Ireland or Kashmir or Sri Lanka or here in the Holy Land. These are not in essence religious conflicts, but they do involve people with identities that are rooted within religious traditions. And if you don't want people to exploit these religious dimensions of who they are negatively, then you need to make sure that they are engaged in it positively. In other words, diplomats and politicians need, if they want to bring peace, need to work together with religious leadership, Muslim, Christian, Jewish leadership, especially here in the Holy Land, in order to touch the hearts and the minds of people to believe that it is possible to live in peace and in mutual respect. If you don't utilize that enormous resource, aside from the fact that you're wasting it, you're alienating it. You're saying you're part of the problem. Well, if you think I'm part of the problem, then I don't think that therefore what you're, the initiative you're taking is probably in my interest, and therefore I will think it's opposed to my interest. So if I don't want religion to be part of the problem, I need to make it part of the solution. Well, Father Makarios, uh, that particular point there, that there has to be an active role played by religious leaders such as yourself to actually bring religion into the discussion, into the solving of problems, do you believe? Yes, uh, I believe in it, as I agree with uh, Rabbi uh, David Rosen. Because uh, if uh, we are, as a religion, we are a part of the society. We are representative, a part of, uh, of the humanity. So, uh, and 
and it's obvious that religion uh, has a great role in the life of uh, uh, of everybody, every human uh, humankind, every uh, every man uh, from different uh, uh, religion uh, b belief aspect. So uh, we are therefore we are taking part as leaders and as believers uh, in the conferences, and I hope our voice can reach to the diplomats and to the politicians and the peace uh, 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 peacemakers or decisions of, uh, of this world. So in order to reach the real picture of uh, the faithful people uh, through the leaders because they cannot reach all, <laughs> all, all the people. So it is a way that he can be in cooperation uh, the politicians and diplomats with the uh, uh, regional leaders uh, to bring uh, uh, the real picture and what the people uh, they are thinking because the religious uh, leaders they are every day in contact uh, with, uh, uh, with the pupil. Yes, and, and yet, Professor Ibrahim, uh, we heard Rabbi Rosen mention, for example, the situation in the Holy Land itself. Um, in decades of attempts at peacemaking there, the religious leaders have been largely sidelined, for example. There has been no direct attempt to engage them in that ongoing dialogue. Is that a mistake? I think it is. I think it's about time now to, to engage them, uh, religious leaders. I think they are... We've been, we have been uh, we're dealing with, with so many of our, you know, uh, friends, uh, rabbis and, um, you know, uh, priests. And, uh, and when we sit together and we de when dis when we discuss the issue, we all agree that this needs to be solved. But really, as uh, Father Makar again said, that we haven't reached to the level that, that our voices are heard by, by the, uh, the politicians. And I think it's about time. And let's, let's give it a chance. I mean, I, I don't know if, it's, we, if we're going to succeed. Uh, our religious leaders, just give them the chance to, to, to share their, uh, their ideas and their uh, ways of, of looking into this uh, problem. And I believe it's, it could be solved. I, and we, all, we all agree that Judaism is not uh, Zionism. It's, it's uh, something different. And we all agree that, that Judaism, as, as, as well as uh, Islam and Christianity, all believe that the Holy Land it should be, uh, it is a Holy Land, it should be given a to, uh, to, uh, chance for every Muslim, Christian, and Jew to live in peace in that land. It was, it was made like that uh, since the, the start of, this, uh, of the universe. So, so let's, let's give our leaders, our religious leaders, the chance to get together to discuss this issue and to bring it up to the level of the, of the politicians. Well, uh, Rabbi David, it, it seems as though the politicians are intentionally keeping out the religious leaders. I mean, that would be the assumption at times. Here you have an agreement which... Um, would take politicians a long time to even begin to get to. Yes, I, I think there's something to what you're saying. Uh, it's, it's a distressing reality and in some way a puzzling one. But I think that very often those who are behind initiatives to find a resolution, uh, usually very good people, are more often than not coming from a secular perspective. And whether they are politicians or diplomats, they're not always comfortable with the world of religious ideas or with religious engagement. And therefore, as they want to control things and they believe that they can deal with them best, they do, I believe, seek to steer clear of the religious voices and of the religious leadership. And this is a totally self-defeating uh, approach, uh, which needs, where we need not to replace the politicians with religious leaders. I'm not sure that that would be a good idea, but at least to bring the religious resources to support initiatives in a constructive way, even to understand what we mean when we use terms. I mean, Dr. Al-Naimi just used the term Zionism in a negative way, and I'm sure most of, your, uh, most of the people who are watching the program would probably share that perception. But one needs to understand that there are people who understand it in a very different way, and one needs to have discourse. One needs to know one another. That, after all, is the commandment of the Holy Quran, to know one another, in order to understand what terms one means, what ideas are behind what one 
says, what one really intends, what are your really motivations, also to understand what are your really are your fears. If we behave violently, almost all violence is an expression of alienation. It's some form of incapacity to be able to deal with a situation and genuine, generally speaking, it comes out of your fear. So if people are fearful, what's behind those fears? Surely the voices of religious tradition that seek to deal with the deepest dimensions of the soul and of the mind and of the heart of the human person can give the most to addressing those fears, to understanding what people's concerns are and enabling us to move ahead. And I think the failure to engage those religious voices is a terrible uh, is, is a terrible mistake. There's a word which I believe Socrates used, uh, uh, the Archbishop will know better than me, I think it's akrasia, which means working against your best intentions and what's really best for you, and I'm afraid politicians do that more often than not. Yes, well, uh, Father Macarius, your view of that, on, on that particular concept of working against your best interests? Uh, yes. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, as I agree that we, we have we have a common interest as as a humanity and uh, we, as as a f a faithful people we we have to to see that common interest and the future of this world because uh, if people there don't, don't understand or they don't know the culture and the religion of each other they cannot come closer they cannot cooperate and they cannot uh, uh, go. Uh, hand by hand uh, together uh, in uh, looking on the future. Well, Professor Ibrahim, this appears to be a two-way process. Is as religious leaders, you stand and bear witness to your religion, but at the same time as well, there has in all th three of these religions a degree of tolerance and openness to the other side. This is an important part, isn't it? That is, it's not just a one-way street. It is a two-way process. It is, in fact, yeah. I mean, I, 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 I understand, and I think we all understand that, uh, that the three monotheistic religions came from one God, and, and they share so many of, uh, you know, common, commonalities, and uh, I think the differences is very, very um, uh, minimal. So uh, uh, that's what we try to do in our conference. We, to, to, we try to capitalize in the commonalities and the things that we share and try to and you use it to the best of our of humanity, and then those who we, that we disagree on, we, should, we can leave it uh, aside. So, so we, we we are we are here not to to disagree. We are here when we meet together to agree on issues. Our conference this time, we talked about the youth. What's the role of the youth? And we brought youth, Muslim, Christian, and and Jewish youth from all over the world to to meet to sit together and discuss these issues and. How can they work together in the future? In 20 years from now, they will be the leaders of this world. So how can they understand, tolerate each other, sit and talk and, and, you know, and negotiate and, and you know, dialogue with each other? This, if we all work that way, I believe we, we have, we'll have a better, uh, a brighter future. Well, Father Makarios, on that particular point, you mentioned the interfaith mm -hmm. dialogue that has been going on in Doha. How important it is it that um, that your followers, that the faithful, see this as an example of a process. They see what you as leaders are doing and then apply it to their daily lives in the villages and towns and cities. Uh, this, is a, this is a problem because sometimes what happens in the four walls, in the rooms of the interfaith dialogues, unfortunately, is not applied to the terrain, to the everyday life. Uh, so we need a lot of work to do and to be uh, influenced by, uh, to, the, uh, to the different uh, uh, people, I mean to the societies of the different religion, but also the, the society, they want to see something uh, uh, that uh, visible uh, because uh, they are following the dialogue, uh, but they see something different on their lives, on the terrain. So this is, um, uh, the, uh, is, uh, this harmony. So, uh, of course, uh, uh, this is our target. But we have to work strong, and to, together and together to promote these uh, f uh, also to the, our societies and communities. But also the community in the the communities they want to see something visible, something that they can feel it, because. 
sometimes they feel that uh, they are unprotected, that they are uh, accused and they are abused. So uh, this feeling is not easy to calm down and to bring the harmony in their souls. And or in, it was some uh, places that it was a harmony between the religion and one conflict all of the sudden came out and so they broke that harmony and now they feel later as enemies. So some interests uh, of, of say financial, politi political interests, they are uh, coming in societies and they are dividing the societies. Uh, so, uh, this, so the people, instead of to see a harmony and peaceful process, they see the opposite. Well, uh, Rabbi David Rosen, if, if, if you may pick up on that particular point, there appears to need uh, to be a need for a, a greater muscularity in terms of applying the kind of interfaith dialogue that, that one has seen to concrete, tangible results on the ground. Do you believe that more work needs to be made and what can be uh, done to achieve that? Uh, of course, but let's, uh, let's make a distinction. There are various kinds of dialogue, there are various kinds of engagement. There are areas where we just get to know one another, which is very important. I referred to, to the Quranic, uh, I, uh, the, uh, I think it's the 47th chapter, verse 13, uh, Litarafu, which is to just to know one another, because we, cannot, we do not truly respect one another if we do not know one another. There are areas where we need to work together areas of social justice, areas to do with our environment, deal challenges of poverty, etc. Uh, there are, are projects which we can do for the benefit of others. But I think what's really important is not only that we serve as an example for our community, that we understand, especially when we are in context of conflict, like here in Israel-Palestine, that you need to be able to show an example to the other side. Uh, you invited me here because I'm a founder of Rabbis for Human Rights. Rabbis for Human Rights is an organization of Israeli rabbis from different denominations who are all loyal citizens of the state of Israel and probably most will call themselves Zionists, who care passionately about Palestinian human rights and who are very much involved in the forefront of showing Palestinians that Jewish Israelis and that rabbis care about their well-being. That demonstration that you help people who are uh, suffered as a result of perhaps uh, a, uh, um, um, I don't know, uh, uh, that some extremist uh, uh, um, um, condemnable acts have uprooted uh, olive trees and you come together and you replant them. You buy these olive trees and you plant them for these people and you show your solidarity with them. Actions of solidarity are what convey the message. So yes, of course, there's enormous work that we have to do internally, but we need to be examples to the other, to each other so that we can get over those barriers that are the results of politics and the result of, uh, of territorialism and of uh, material interests and that we can show the spirit of, of love, of respect and of cooperation towards one well, another. Well, Professor Abraham, very quickly, it appears that what we are looking at is the attempt to find that which makes people closer together rather than that which pushes them aside. Does that sum it up? Yes, exactly. That's what we try to do. But, but again, I, I would like to comment with uh, my, uh, my partners here. Uh, yes, uh, there are a lot of work going on around the world. There's grassroots projects. There are uh, university and uh, schools projects going on. And uh, as uh, the rabbi said, they, they do uh, help the, those, uh, the, with, with the planting uh, those um, olive trees. And there, but here in Qatar, for example, we don't see it because we are majority uh, Muslim uh, community, but we can see it very clearly in, in countries like in the U.S. and the U.K. and in Europe. And, this, and they came yesterday and the day before, and they showed us so many of these wonderful projects, books written together by Muslim Christ and Christian Jews, uh, projects uh, all over the, the country, helping the poor, helping the needy people. So there, there, there is great work going on. We need to support this. We need to help in, in pro, uh, promoting this through the channels like yours and the other uh, media stations. Well, at that point, my thanks to our guests, Professor Ibrahim Salah Al-Naimi and Archbishop Makarios Mavrogianakis here in Doha and Rabbi David Rosen in Jerusalem. And do please to add your voice to this discussion. Leave us your thoughts on Facebook and Twitter 
I'm Mike Hanna. Thanks for watching. From me and all the team, goodbye for now.